Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chapter 12 of House, on the Sc House of the Scorpion, if I can talk. Uh, just a reminder, don't really like asking, but my Patreon link is in the description. Check it out. Again, you don't have to support me, but it's appreciated. Anyway, Chapter 12, The Thing on the Bed. Matt, Matt woke up feeling gritty and hot. The candle in front of the virgin had burned out, leaving a waxy smell that the curtains held in. He opened a window, wincing at the sudden invasion of sunlight. It was late morning. Celia had already gone to work. Rubbing his eyes, Matt saw, Matt saw Maria's present on the shelf, and the birthday party came back with hideous clearness. He knew he had to make things up to her, but she, he also knew she needed time to cool down. If he approached her now, she'd only slam the door in his face. Matt dressed in cool clothes and found leftover pizza for breakfast. The apartment was empty. The walled garden deserted except for birds. He went out and watered the vegetables. After a birthday party was a, the day after a birthday party was always a letdown. The power Matt enjoyed as El Patron's clone vanished. The servants went back to ignoring him. The Alacrans treated him like something Furball had coughed up on the carpet. <coughs> the hours dragged on. Matt practiced on his guitar, a skill he was developing without Mr. Ortega's help. The music master was unable to keep his hands on the instrument, and thus was unable to detect mistakes. After a while, Matt switched to reading Tamlin's present. The bodyguard was found fond of nature books, although he read them at a painfully slow rate. Matt had books on wildfire, camping, map reading, and survival that Tamlin fully expected him to study. Tamlin drilled him when they went on expeditions in the Aho Mountains. All Matt's activities were supposed to be risk-free, thus he was only left... He was allowed to ride only safe horses, and could swim only if two lifeguards were present. He could climb ropes only if there was a mountain of mattresses underneath. Any bruise or cut was treated with an extreme alarm. But once a week, Tamlin took Matt on an educational field trips. The field trips were disguised as visits to the Alcran's nuclear power plant or the opium processing plant, a stinking, clanking whore even an idiot would find unbearable. Halfway there, Tamlin would turn the horses toward the hills. Matt lived for these expeditions. El Patron would have a heart attack if he knew how many cliffs Matt climbed and how many rattlesnakes he teased out of the rocks. But they made Matt feel strong and free. May I come in? said a faint, uncertain voice. Matt jumped. <coughs> He'd been daydreaming. He heard the person enter the room. It's, Feli it's Felicia, said Felicia hesitantly, as though she were quite, quite sure of her identity. This is completely weird, Matt thought. Felicia had never shown the slightest interest in him. What do you want, he asked. I th thought I might visit. Felicia's eyes looked heavy, like she might fall asleep at any moment. A vague odor of cinnamon hung around her. Why? Matt knew he was being rude, but when ch when had the alacran been any alacrans been anything else to him? Besides, there was something creepy about the way Felicia swayed back and forth. May I sit? Matt pulled the chair over to her since it didn't look like she'd make it to make it by herself. He tried to help her, but she pushed him pushed him away. Of course, he was a clone. He wasn't supposed to touch humans. Felicia half fell into the chair, and they stared at each other for a moment. You're a good good musician, Felicia stammered as though it hurt her to admit it. How do you know? Matt couldn't remember ever playing when she was around. Everyone says so. It's such a surprise El Patron doesn't have a have a musical bone in his body. He enjoys listening, Matt said. He didn't like to hear El Patron criticized. I know, he used to listen to me. <coughs> Matt felt uneasy. He'd probably taken away what little attention Felicia got from other people. I was a great concert pianist once, she said. I've heard you play. You have? Felicia's eyes whined. Oh, the music room. I was much better before I had my... my... nervous breakdown, said Matt. Her hesitant speech was getting on his nerves. But that isn't why I came. I want to... to... <coughs> Matt waited impatiently. Help you, finished Felicia. There was another long pause as Matt wondered what kind of help she thought he needed. You upset Maria. She cried all night. Matt felt uncomfortable. What did Felicia want have to do with this? She wants to see you. Okay, said Matt. But she 
Don't you see? Her father won't let him come here. It's up to you. What should I do? <clears throat> Go to her. Go to her, cried Felicia with more energy than Matt had expected. Go now. The outburst seemed to exhaust her. Her head drooped in her eyes, and she closed her eyes. You wouldn't have something to drink, she whispered. Celia doesn't keep alcohol. Should I call one of the maids? <clears throat> Never mind. Felicia sighed, rousing herself to stand. Maria's waiting at the hospital. It's important. With that, Felicia made her way to the door and drifted to the hall like a cinnamon-scented ghost. The hospital wasn't a place Matt went willingly. Set apart from the rest of the buildings, it was surrounded by a wasteland of sand and low, flat, bullhead vines. The vines protected their turf with the meanest, nastiest thorns ever and could stab through shoes. <clears throat> Matt picked his way carefully through the wasteland. Heat radiated off the ground, making gray, windowless buildings shimmer. The hospital was like a prison with strange, alarming smell inside that permeated everything. Matt was dragged there twice a year to undergo painful and humiliating tests. He sat on the front steps and inspected his sandals for bullheads. Maria was probably in the waiting room. It wasn't too bad there. The chairs and magazines and cold drink machine. Sweat ran down Matt's face as he stuck his shirt to his chest. He opened the door. I don't see why I should talk to you at all, said Maria. She was sitting in one of the chairs with the magazine open on her lap. Her eyes looked puffy. It was your idea. Matt bit his tongue, but he didn't want to pick a fight. I mean, it was a good idea. You're the one who invited me, said Maria. Why couldn't you find somewhere nice? This place is creepy. <clears throat> Matt's alarm system went on at once. I didn't invite you. Wait, he cried as Maria started to get up. I do want to see you. I guess... I guess I was a pig at the birthday party. You guess, Maria said scornfully. Okay, I was. But you didn't have to take back the present. Of course I did. A present's no good if it's given in anger. Matt stopped, to, stopped his fist, first reply before it could get out. It's the nicest gift I ever got. Oh sure, nicer than that weenie sports car El Patron gave you. Matt sent Dan next to her. She moved away as far as she could. I really like how you wrapped the candy. It took me a long time to decide which papers to use. Maria's voice trembled. You only had... You'll only wad them up and throw them away. No, I won't, promised Matt. I'll spread them out and carefully and keep them for always. Maria said nothing. She stared down at her hands. Matt edged closer. The truth was, he liked it when she kissed him, even if she kissed for a ball sixty times as often. He'd never kissed her back, but he, m he might try it now to make up. Good, you're both here. Matt recoiled. Tom stood in the doorway. How did you find us? Matt snarled. <coughs> Of course he knew where we were. You told him to bring me here. No kidding, said Matt. The pieces were falling into place now. Tom had pretended to carry a message to Maria, and Felicia had done the same with Matt. They had to be working together. Matt never thought of Felicia as dangerous, but you, he didn't really know her. I thought you might like to see something, Tom said. His face was open and friendly, but his blue eyes shone with innocence. Matt wanted to roll him in the bullheads. Here, said Maria doubtfully. It's like Halloween, only better. It's the ugliest, gushiest thing you ever saw, and I bet both of you wet your pants, Tom said. I've done things that would make your eyes drop out, Maria sneered. Tamlin showed me how to pick up scorpions and let a tarantula walk up my arm. <clears throat> Matt was surprised at Maria's daring. Tamlin had shown him the same thing, but Matt uh, had almost done what Tom described. This is worse, Tom said. Remember that Halloween when you brought, thought the chupacabras were outside and Matt put chicken guts in your bed? I did not. It was you, cried Matt. You put your hand right in, said Tom, ignoring Matt, and screamed your head off. That was so evil, Maria said. I didn't do it, protested Matt. <coughs> well, this is worse, gloated Tom. I don't know if you have the, pardon the expression, guts for it. She doesn't, said Matt. Don't tell me what to do. Maria got a mullish look in her eyes, and Matt's heart sank. He knew Tom was up to something foul, but he hadn't figured out what it was yet. Come on, he's only starting to try start trouble. Matt tried to grab Maria's hand, but she yanked her arm away. Listen, Tom opened the door leading from the waiting room to the rest of the hospital. Matt's stomach hit rock bottom. He had memories of some of those rooms. Tom's face glowed with joy. 
it was then Matt discovered he was most dangerous. As Tamlin said, if you didn't know Tom well, you'd think he was an angel bringing you the keys to the pearly gates. In the distance, they heard a mewling sound. It went on for a moment, then stopped, and began again. Is that a cat? said Maria. If it is, it isn't yelling for milk, Matt thought. There was a level of terror and despair that the sound made <coughs> the air stand up on his neck. This time he did grab Maria's hand. They're doing experiments on cats, Maria cried suddenly. Oh, please, you've got to help me rescue them. We'd better ask permission first, said Matt. He was deeply unwilling to go beyond that door. No one's going to give us permission, Maria stormed. Don't you see? Adults don't see anything wrong with those experiments. We have to take the cats away. Dada will help me. The doctors won't even know where they're gone. They'll only get more. Matt felt cold as he listened to the sound going on and on. That's the dodge people always use. Don't help anyone. And they'll only find more illegals to enslave or poor people to starve or cats to torture. Maria was working herself into a state. Matt despair, despaired of getting her to listen to reason. Look, we should ask your dad at first, he began. I won't listen to that cat suffer one more instant. Are you with me or not? If not, I'm going by myself. I'll go with you, said Tom. That decided Matt. There was no way he was going to let Tom take Maria by herself to see whatever horror he had stashed away. Maria strode down the hall, but he slowed the closer they got to the cries. Matt held in her hand. Matt still held her hand. There was a cold and sweaty, or maybe his hand was. His hand was. The sound wasn't exactly like a cat. It wasn't like anything Matt had heard before, but there was no mistaking the anguish in it. Sometimes it rose almost to a shriek and then faded as though whatever was making the noise was exhausted. They arrived at the door. It was closed, and cravenly Matt hope and cravenly Matt hoped it was locked. It wasn't. Tom threw it open. Matt could hardly register what lay on the bed before him. It rolled its eyes and thrashed helplessly in the straps that restrained it. Its mouth opened in a horrible O when it saw the children, and it screamed louder than Matt thought possible. It screamed until it ran out of air, then it wheezed until it didn't have enough strength to do that anymore, and lay on the bed. Lay, then it lay there, panting and gasping. It's a boy, whispered Maria. It was. Only at first Matt thought it was some kind of beast. So alien and terrible was his face. It had dodgy, unhealthy skin and red hair that stuck up in bristles. It seemed never to have been in the sun, where it stands twisted like claws above the straps that held it down. It was dressed in green hospital pajamas that had been befouled by its terror. All of the terrible energy that rolled through the trapped body. The creature never stopped moving. It was though an invisible snake were rippling beneath its skin, forcing its arms and legs to move in ceaseless bid for freedom. It's not a boy, Tom said scornfully. It's a clone. Matt felt as though he'd been punched in the stomach. He'd never seen another clone. He'd only felt the weight of hatred humans had for such things. <coughs> he hadn't understood it became after all. Clones were like dogs and cats. Humans loved them. If he thought about it, he had assumed that it was a pet, only a very intelligent one. Matt became aware that Maria no longer held his hand. She'd shrunk against Tom and had his arm around her. The creature, clone, had regained its energy and was screaming again. Something about the children terrified it, or perhaps it was terrified all the time. Its tongue protruded from its mouth and drooled saliva down its chin. Who's, whispered Maria, McGregor's. He's a real wreck. His liver's all eaten up with alcohol, said Tom in a casual chatty way. Mom says he looks something like the Grim Reaper forgot to pick up. Mom, thought Matt. Felicia. Are they going to, said Maria. Tonight, Tom said. I can't bear to look at him, wailed Maria. I don't want to think about it. Tom pulled her away, and Matt knew he was enjoying every minute of this. Should I leave you two alone together, Tom inquired of the doorway. Matt had trouble tearing his eyes from the thing on the bed. There was no way he could be the same sort of being as that creature. It wasn't possible. The creature opened its mouth to make another horrible scream, and Matt suddenly knew who it looked like. It resembled McGregor, of course, because it was his clone, but McGregor was an adult, with differences that made it hard to see the connection. It was a lot closer, too. Close enough to show kinship. It looks like you, Matt said to Tom. You wish, you wish, yelled Tom, dropping his cheerful grin. Look, Maria, it has the same red hair and ears, but she refused to look up. Take me out of here, she moaned with her face buried in Tom's shirt. I'm not like that thing, shouted Matt. Use your eyes. 
He tried to pull her from Tom, and she shrieked. Don't touch me. I don't want to think about it. Matt was beside himself with frustration. You wanted to come down here to rescue a cat. Well, look at this. It needs rescuing. No, 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 whimpered Maria. She was in a state of utter panic. Take me away, she wailed. Tom hurried her down the hall. He glanced back with a look of savage triumph. Matt had to clench his teeth very hard to keep from running after them, pounding Tom within an inch of his life. It wouldn't do Maria any good. It wouldn't do Matt any good either, except to convince her that he, that he really was a beast. Their footsteps died away. Matt stood for a moment in the hallway, listening to the mewling of the thing on the bed. Then the door. Then he closed the door and followed them. End of chapter twelve. <clears throat> Well, that was pretty fucked up. But that's the end of chapter 12. I'm sorry I just uploaded the last video today, but to make it up to you guys, you guys are going to get three chapters today. I'm going to record chapter 13 immediately when I'm done uh, done with this one. And remember to, ch remember to click the link in the description, check out my Patreon, and I will see you all in a few minutes.